Hi everyone, I'm Phil Liggett and for the next 12 days I'm privileged to join the Motorola team and just see how a top flight multi-million dollar team faces up to what is a most important week on the world professional calendar. It is the spring classic time here in northern Europe and we're going to see them prepare for Paris-Roubaix as the hell of the north in northern France and then down in the Belgian Ardennes where they will prepare and ride liege baston liege Two totally different classics and two of the oldest classics on the world calendar. Paris-Roubaix began in 1896, the liege baston liege in 1894. One is over cobblestones in northern France one is in the beautiful Ardennes, where the hills are short but very steep, and two different types of cyclists are often called for. The Motorola team is a new team on the professional cycling circuit, and that's why I've chosen to try and follow them and see how they prepare. They're allowing us into all of their team meetings, providing we say we won't tell the other riders what they say during these very special private occasions. We'll also see how they prepare and talk to people like Andy Hampston, the newcomer Phil Anderson, and of course the man who lost Paris Bay by a millimetre last year, Steve Bauer. This is a team that has a lot of pressure on it. It's a new sponsor who wants to see results. Already Phil Anderson has given them two big race victories. Now can Steve Bauer win Paris Bay? Or can Anderson or Hampston come out and win Liège Baston Liège? We will feel that pressure. We will speak to these riders and the manager and you will feel it with us. The Motorola team has 15 riders taken from five countries, but the immediate difference between them and other professional teams is that all except Dag Otto Lauritsen speak English as a first language. This winter, with a new sponsor to impress, team director Jim Okovich signed Australian Phil Anderson, who at 32 was seeking fresh pastures after 11 years as a professional. Okovich is a shrewd judge of man, and Anderson already had won both the Tour of the Mediterranean and the Sicilian Week. Anderson joins Steve Bauer a year after the Canadian left his Swiss team and both are glad to have Englishman Sean Yates alongside them. John Tomac is in his second season after an exciting amateur career that included notable mountain bike success. And there's Frankie Andreu, a 1988 Olympian of whom much is expected this year. But Bauer is the name everyone talks of. Steve Bauer joined Okovic last season, and a French newspaper then claimed that he was being paid half a million dollars. Steve's a quiet man who usually lets his legs do the talking, and when he makes conversation, he also makes every word count. Beaten to the gold medal in the Los Angeles Olympic Games by Alexei Greywall, Bauer turned professional and immediately took a third place world championship medal in Spain. Bauer and Anderson are the team's leaders, but they rely heavily on the others, like extrovert Bob Roll from Santa Fe, whose humour helps keep morale high. And there's Andy Bishop from Arizona, but who lives in Belgium during the season. Not too far away, in fact, from Dag Otto Lauritsen, the Norwegian champion who almost won the world title last year in Japan. It's April now, the team is divided, and its other superstar, Andy Hampson, is away racing in Spain. The Spring Classics in Northern Europe are underway and Bauer knows he must rise to the occasion. Today the team has been training and tomorrow it's the classic Ghent Wavelgum. Eric Hyden hands out the team's schedule. The Ghent Wavelgum race, like all of Belgium's classic races, attracts the best riders. It's seen as a stepping stone to the upcoming Paris-Roubaix. There's a taste of cobblestones and the short steep hills in Flanders always hurt. It would be nice if Motorola won, but that's not necessarily the intention. John Hendershot, one of the 12 support crew and one of three team masseurs, gives Dagotto a light rub before the start, while Steve Bauer is looking for proof that he is approaching good form for Paris-Roubaix on Sunday. It's an important time of the year, even though the season is only two months old. There's Greg Lamond, the Triple Tour de France winner has yet to win a classic race and Laurent Fignon, who lost the tour to Greg by eight seconds in 89. Also on parade is Eddie Plankett and Frenchman Charlie Motte, a climber with classic ambitions this year. And the rest, who make up the 198 riders inside the velodrome on the outskirts of Ghent.
It's a novel start, but professional riders often get asked to do strange things. And with five hours to go, no one rushes for the door of the velodrome as they roll out into the chill Belgian air of springtime. Paris Roubaix and Liège Baston Liège are World Cup races. Gent Wavelgum isn't. So to race your heart out today and win is rather like playing your best shot on the club putting green. For a long time, the field stayed together, and team publicity director Paul Sherwing keeps in touch with manager Okovitz. Not much you want to know about. Not really. I'll see you later. The race ends, won by the Soviet sprinter Zhemodolin Abdu Zhaparov, his best win to date. But a thousand meters down the road, Phil Anderson's chance of victory has ended in a heavy fall, the sort of news the team did not want to hear. Anderson had taken quite a tumble, but the cuts, although plenty of them, seem superficial. Still, he will be plenty stiff for a few days and would not now ride Paris Roubaix. Hey, John. My bike just over here, man. Sit there. You better watch out so you can snag it. Frankie Andrea had also ridden well, finishing 12th in the 210 km Classic, best of the team. Bob Roll, joined by his new wife, had found the race dangerous and was clearly unhappy. This was the last race before Paris-Roubaix, and it had not gone well. Even on the uphill, people were crashing. I've never seen anything like it. It was dangerous. I've never seen so many crashes. So you in the beginning, you guys were Yeah, we were taking it easy. They took it easy, but... Once they started going fast, oh. game over. It was a disaster. No, it was just dangerous because of the wind. You know. At least the 200 kilometers would have helped with the training, and now the team had to start thinking about Sunday and Paris Roubaix. Next yeah, would be the traditional training ride to the Hell of the North. At the team's headquarters in Holstra, Belgium, George Noyes and Neil Lacey, the team mechanics, load the bicycles for the run into France. In Europe, a frontier is never far away and most cyclists talk their own version of French, English or Dutch, the language spoken in Holster yeah. and the Flanders area of Belgium. And the new sponsorship from Motorola has an added bonus. Okovic can keep the office in the car. It's all mud. Yeah. That'd be bad. Well, there's no pavé, it's just all mud. It's like a dirt well, road. The pavé is just covered yeah. in crap. <laughs> oh, we'll be in trouble. Uh, Steve and Frankie uh, study the thin lines on the map the while they wait at Dag Otto Lauritsen's house. Right. Matt? Are you driving, Doc? Yeah. yeah. This is what we'll be going through. <laughs> While outside, John Tomac, who raced Paris Bay for the first time last year and finished, decides to fill time practicing pitching before he breaks the news that. I forgot my passport out. There's always one, isn't there? The Paris Bay is in France, John, and this is Belgium. On a bike, the checkpoints ignore cyclists normally, but not when they are sat on the cars. Yeah, hey, uh, we're making a passport stop here on the corner. From the assembly point to the course is about two hours' drive. Bauer and Tomac travel together. I suppose you can ride from the forest to the finish, or you can drive from the forest for a while and then ride the final and ride home. Well, that's it from the forest here, 100 k's. Trevor Forey Darenberg from 157 to 160. Yeah, 105. There's still quite a bit of pavé, huh? That's, uh, that's 40 kilometers of pavé from the forest, you know? It's <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah, My suggestion I can't is. I believe we did the whole thing last year. My suggestion is we drive about. Drive about you know, 15 k's of pavé there. So there's some really long sections that are pretty boring, you know. After after the forest. If you guys want to ride, I'll watch it. You know. It's John Tomac's second <laughs> Paris Roubaix, but for Andy Bishop, the adventure is about to begin. Is this your first Paris Roubaix? Yes, it is. Yeah. What do you think of it? What do you think of the Forest of Arlanda? 
it the first time uh, you saw it today? Yeah, I could, well, I'd seen it a few times on TV, but first time in person. Yeah. What did you think? Ah, it looks, it's, when it's dry, it looks a lot better. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, it'll be a lot harder in the race, naturally, before the, uh... Oh, yeah. Are you looking forward to the race? Yes, I am. Yeah, I want to do this race. I mean, for a while, I'm one of the sadistic people, I guess, that want to <laughs> do, the, do the race. But, yeah, I am looking forward to it. What do you hope to achieve? Ah, uh, we, we have, um, you know, good riders on the team, and I think, you know, if just... He was working well. You know, Steve was second here last year, and, yeah. and I think you know we can always improve on second place. And so, yeah, I'll ride for the um, you know team. It's good to be back on a European team. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Also with the team is Eric Hayden. Well, Eric, speed skating, Tour de France rider, Tour of Italy rider, now almost a qualified doctor, and you're going out with the boys on the bike again. What's going on? i got to try to stay in shape while I'm with them. <laughs> you look as though you're in pretty good shape, actually. Uh, yeah. Are you going to last with them? No. But, uh, well, I'm here just while Max isn't around, try to take over what he does as team doctor, and then uh, when he comes back... What sort of problems... Because you, you've only just come in, haven't you? Yeah. Into Europe. Yeah. What sort of problems have you had so far? Uh, so far, it's mostly just been accidents, and then a couple guys getting the flu, and so it's been pretty easy stuff. With the accidents, it's just cleaning up cuts and make sure that everybody kind of takes care of them. Yeah. How's the new uh, career coming along? Another couple months and I will be an MD, so it's getting <laughs> close. <laughs> so I mustn't become injured now. <laughs> no, don't get sick. <laughs> <laughs> what about Phil Anderson? He had a fall in Get Webblegum. Is, uh, is he okay? He's okay. He's just, he got skinned up. He did both his elbows, both his hips, and both his knees. So he did a very good job of falling down. But other than uh, some scrapes, that's about it. Yeah. And you're going to get on the bike and go with the guys, eh? Bounce over the cobblestones a little bit. He's a big man to bounce. <laughs> Those big legs, Eric. <laughs> I hope the tires hold out. What a great character Haydn is. In Holland, he is still famous after his five Olympic speed skating gold medals. But it was time now to get the feel of those cobblestones. Riding them leaves little to the imagination. The bone-rattling roads are real, and the faster you go, the more you bounce. Here in France, they are fast disappearing, and they say only 80 kilometers remain. If the cobblestones do disappear, then Paris-Roubaix will soon follow. Efforts are being made to reserve both the cobblestones and Paris Bay, and this was a full dress rehearsal. The team cars are equipped and drinks are taken, eventually on the move. One concern, though, is the weather. It's too nice, and Paris Bay will be on a day full of dust. Bob Roll, who has finished the race four times, goes in front alone as he sets a pace no one seems really interested in. Eric's bike, by the way, is already back on top of the car. As the tracks reveal their secrets, riding the stones is an art in itself. The riders usually use high gears and constantly search for the smoothest stretch they can find. But it isn't easy. For Steve Bauer, the final preparations are almost over. I mean, we're just 48 hours away from the race, but you did quite a few kilometers today. Well, yesterday I recuperated from uh, the race on Wednesday, again, gone weevil again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, yesterday I felt quite a bit tired, so I didn't do any hard training. But today I thought I needed a little bit more before Sunday. So uh, we looked at, uh, mainly we looked at the final part of the race, checked mm -hmm. out the, the areas of pavé and, and what the condition the pavé was in. And then after, uh, after doing the last part of the race course, I, I rode uh, to my home here in Belgium, which was only, say, 30 kilometers away. But I also did a bit of motor pacing behind the motorcycle. So that would help me uh, get a little more speed, you know, get, keep, keep the legs turning really well and uh, actually probably help recuperate a bit from riding on the, on the cobbles too. Let's just go back one year, almost to the day now, Steve. Everybody's still talking about that fabulous finish. This ride now by Van Hoedom goes high, opens the door to Steve Bauer. Bauer comes on the inside, and it looks as though Steve Bauer's going to get that first classy victory on the line. They are almost together, and you know Eddie Plankton was right on him on the line. We'll have to look at that again. But there was I was disappointed, definitely, to be second, you know, but also I knew that uh, I'd done my best race, and I think... You know, when you realize that you've done your best performance, no matter what the outcome, you have to be somewhat satisfied. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one, one more centimeter is, is, is a bit of luck, you know, so um, you have to take it, uh, take it as it comes, as sport in a way. Normally, when you hit a line together like that, you know if you've won or lost. Did you know or did you, did you still feel... No, I, d I, didn't, I didn't really know, but I, had, I just had a sensation that it, it was probably because he was coming from behind that I thought that he might have got it, but... 
uh, it was too close to really, you know, to really realize. It was a cruel way to take defeat, but Steve Bauer had been part of the most exciting finish the race had ever seen. Later in the year, he was making news again, this time after taking the lead in the Tour de France from an early breakaway group on the very first day. His fourth place in the Tour in 1988 had made him a respected man, but when he escaped with three other riders last year, they were to swap the lead right until the final weekend. Bauer held on to the Maillot Jaune for nine stages, until the hills eventually took their toll and he passed across to Frenchman Ronan Pensec. But before that happened, Bauer showed all of his qualities as a champion. He could lead a race and lead a team. The quiet Canadian still didn't win many races, but he certainly knew how to grab the headlines and the all-important publicity. Once in the lead, Bauer knew how to fight and would never give up. But on the major leaders in the Tour, Delgado and Le Monde, you haven't lost a great deal. Um, well, you know, they still have to make up a lot of time, and, uh, you know, I'm still in the bike race. There's, uh, you know, I lost the yellow jersey today, but uh, there's no means, uh, you know, completely out of the race, and uh, I'm still going to push myself, and I'm, I'm still in the race. So, uh, you know, tomorrow's another day. You lost the yellow jersey today, but will we see you in it again before we get back into the mountains? Never know. Never know. And how do you feel about losing the yellow jersey? You've lost it before. Well, you know, I think uh, what, instead of losing it, I have to think about, uh, you know, the 10 days that I kept it. And uh, that's a great souvenir for my career. And, um, you know, if I can get it back, I'll get it back. If not, then uh, I'll do my best race. You've worn the yellow jersey on two separate years of the Tour de France. Uh, one day, will you be keeping it in Paris? <laughs> Tough to say, you know, it's, uh, there's not too many riders that can win uh, the Tour de France. So, you know... Realistically, it'd be, it'd be very, very difficult, you know, but I'm also aiming to do my best race there. And uh, if I get the jersey again, well, that'd be fabulous, you know. As you're a professional, you're expected to always produce a result when you get on a bike. And of course, they sometimes forget that you are a human being as well. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't happen. How do you actually lift yourself back up, motivate yourself to go back out there and try and do better again? Well, I think for this weekend, definitely the, you know, my race last year is going to give me a tremendous boost to confidence. I think that uh, had I not done so well last year, that you know I might I might be a little bit less motivated than I will be this year, and I think holding on to that uh, performance last year is going to help me a lot on Sunday. The day was now just 24 hours away, and the team had moved to its hotel in Compiègne, 80 kilometers north of Paris, where the race begins. The mechanics never seem to rest. Just as they finish the bikes, the team goes training and is back to cleaning, retuning and checking. Of all of the team's helpers, the mechanics seem to have the least use of a hotel room. The sun is still shining and the riders have taken their final chance to stay loose. Frankie Andreu then comes in with more work for the mechanics. These days, Paris-Roubaix does not seem to demand a great deal of different equipment. But one point of concern is the thickness of handlebar tape to avoid, or at least delay, the blisters forming. Or you could run a strip of tape across and then I could tape over it. Yeah. Could you do that? Just one, one way, way, please. Where? Just on the top. Yeah. So just on the... Like, uh... So if I run a, on a strip like this, or back here, right? I'm thinking about maybe double tape over the tape. Yeah, that's clear though. Like so. Yeah. You don't need anything, John. It just makes it a bit softer. Tape over a little bit. Huh? Okay. Top and bottom. That don't have to do it here. Not even here? No. Just on the top. I mean, you could do it there if you want, if you don't mind. You can do it wherever you want it. Yeah. Just do it all around. Yeah. Yeah. From like starting from yeah. about right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alright, do you want extra tape? Ooh. I don't want to extra tape. Top layer. Are you going to do someone else's bike for sure? Yeah, I'm going to do, okay, do someone else first and then I'll see what yeah, he does. Here, I can do it right now. Okay. Yeah. That's gross. 
It does? Yeah, it feels big. No, I just put normal. No. Oh. So good. You know best. No, it's all in the hands anyway. You have to relax your hands. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you wanted uh, maybe something different than 1219. Seemed to work pretty good there, I don't know. Yeah, it seemed to work pretty good. What was the head The boys seemed to be spending more time than usual with the mechanics. Next day, they knew broken bikes and wheels would be commonplace. George is more interested now in the tires with Steve. In between the chat, autograph hunters avoid the crush of Sunday, while George talks about tire pressure, measured in atmospheres. The wrong pressure on the cobbles could lead to a flat at a crucial time. Actually, at 5 and 5.6. Actually, it's 5.1 and 5.6. We told you it was 5 and 5.5. Five and I think that's uh, good pressure for you there. Maybe. Just got to have good legs. Yeah. But Barra's had enough. It's time for a massage. He leaves the mechanics to do what they do best every day of the season. The bicycle preparation will go on into the early hours of the morning. How many bikes have you done today, man? Uh, I don't even remember. I mean, it's not actually that many when you think of it. It's only like 16 bikes, but a million wheels and... Uh, it's just uh, never ending. How many pairs ending. of wheels do you carry on, Perry? Back? We're preparing like 30 pairs, and then we'll have uh, seven pairs in the car following, and then another uh, five pairs in another car, and five pairs in another car, and then all the wheels the guys are using, and then all the wheels are in the spare bikes, so all have to, and they're all with the special uh, larger profile tire there. So uh, that's like uh, 60 tires to glue on just for one day, and then take them all off the next day. So. For a race on Wednesday. <laughs> for a race yeah. on Wednesday. Upstairs, the riders check in for a massage at a pre-booked time. It's important they are not late, as this throws the system into some disarray. Head masseur is Trudy Roberts, who has the job of taking the pain out of racing, even before you have any. Joined by Jody Walner, Trudy then must make sure all is ready at the restaurant where the team will walk for dinner. It's rather like the Last Supper. Jim Okovitz has okayed some wine, so Sean Yates passes the list to Steve. What's the budget? <laughs> no budget Still no one talks of Paris Roubaix. If it wasn't for all the team cars parked around the streets outside, I might wonder if this was the right weekend. <laughs> It has a delicate bouquet, fruity yet mm, smoky. Plenty of pasta and salad, more pasta and salad, washed down with a glass of wine. This professional racing is beginning to become more appealing. On the morning of Paris Roubaix, George is still there at it, and the three places laid for the mechanics at dinner the previous night went unfilled. Neil Lacey explains the very latest in brake levers that also double as a gear shift. To apply the brake, you just use it in a normal manner. But to sh shift the bike, the, s the large lever shifts it to a, a lower gear, and then the small lever brings it into a higher gear. And the small one only shifts one gear at a time. The large one, you can shift uh, one gear, or you can shift two gears, or three gears at a time. Because the road is so bumpy, the riders uh, have a, a little trouble when they take their hands off the bar to use a conventional shifter. So this will uh, hopefully give them a lot more control. And the left, the left lever works in the same way. To shift into the large chain ring, you use the large lever to bring it back. It's a small one. It's like going to war. The final briefing and the atmosphere is a nervous one. Steve K. No problem. You got the band-aids already, eh? Huh? You got the band-aids and the thumbs? You want to hit that TV? Bob, you're right there. Watch your head. Do you guys know where the start is today? It's the Place de General de Gaulle. Same as last year, that palace up the road here. So everybody has to make sure, go downstairs, you should leave together, go to the start, sign in and we'll work our way into the crowd with the cars and get settled in.
The swanier cars have to leave 15 minutes before the start, so if you need, make sure you, you when you get over there, you get your feed, you get your other stuff right away. Uh, if you want something for your legs, so that because they've got to leave 15 minutes before the start. It can also take a feed from the car after the first 50 kilometers until the last 20. The same last procedure. 20? Till 20 to go. Till 20, 20 kilometers to go. You have to come behind the commissar's car to do that unless you're in a group of 15 or less. Then you put your hand up and I go up to the group and I can give you something right out of the car. Unless the commissar <laughs> tells me no and then, I'll, then I won't give you anything. So do not throw your bottles away until you're absolutely sure I can hand you something. But, so hang on to your bottle at least until I've handed it to you and it's a, it's a clear. Um, the first 110 kilometers till we get to the first pave, you know, Andy, you and Nathan are going to be 100% working, working with Steve. That means you stop for everything, for flats, for crashes, you get him his food. If he needs clothing, he wants to take something back, you keep him out of the wind, you got to cover him 100%. Holding it. Until you, get to the, until you get to the first pave. And Doug, you and uh, uh, Frankie should, should be like real watchful at the start for those early breaks that go. Also, you two guys, you and, you and Frankie should be setting Steve up and bringing him to the front when we get near the pave, all right? And setting him up in a good position so when he hits that pave, he's in the first 20 or 30 riders. You know, wherever he wants to be, he should be there and you guys should help him, keep him out of the wind and get them up to a good position, all right? And then you're on your own. Um, John, you, Sean, and Bob are gonna pretty much ride your own race. Once you get to the pave, it's all, it's all for Steve. You know, you gotta stay up front. You should go in breaks if there's a break going. You know, like if, if Frankie or Doug or Andy or, or Nate, you're, you know, you're feeling good. You too, even though you've done this up to this point, if you haven't had to do too much work and things have gone pretty well, you're still, you should be up there as well, and in good position, riding at the front, and always keeping an eye on Steve. And any problems, you got to stop right away and give up a wheel, and then bring him back to the to the position he's at. Okay, you don't even think about it. The first guy that sees him get a flat, you have to stop immediately, give him a wheel, because I'm going to be so far behind that you know it's going to be five, ten minutes. Sometimes I'll be behind the group, so make sure you stop, and then you wait for me. When you're in a break situation, remember this, and we've, we've emphasized it all along, don't overwork in the breakaway. If you get into a break situation, only do as much work as everybody else is doing. Just come through, but don't drive the breakaway. You know, just do your bit. It's a long ways to the finish line, and I don't want anybody saying, yeah, I was in this break, and I felt so good, and I was working well, and then I'll, all of a sudden I blew. You know, <laughs> I don't want to hear that tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know, you're going to come into the velodrome, and... When you got a lap and a half on the velodrome, it's a pretty big velodrome. Remember this, when you're sprinting, do what Steve did last year. You know, road riders always tend to drift in the last, when they're coming out of the turns. And if you come, there's always plenty of room underneath to come around. Don't necessarily do that, but keep an eye out for that opportunity. Because what happens is they're, they're looking like this and they start to drift a little bit. The more they go like that, the farther up they go. And by the time they come out of the turn, they're, they're already way out of the pole line and the pole's wide open. And you can stay in the pole, that's all, it's legal. When a guy drifts out, you can come underneath him once he leaves the pole. So just keep an eye out for that if you're in a, if you're in a sprint situation. Everyone puts on a brave face to prevent their real feelings becoming infectious. Djimokovic wants a result, and the riders know they must try and give him one. That briefing, though, was held an hour before the start, and now the riders have moved to the start line. There's a hint of rain, and the weather appears on the change. And the Sheila Griffin, Motorola's corporate director of advertising, she's flown in from Chicago. I mean, just tell me, Sheila, why has Motorola become involved in cycle racing? I think uh, because as we grow, uh, get into the emerging personal communications businesses, we want the Motorola name more well known to the general public. Well, let's hope after the day at least we've got Steve Bauer flying the flag. That's right. Yeah, Steve Bauer certainly does the job for getting the Motorola name out there. You're basically happy with the start of the season for Anderson's yes, been very well. Yes, they've been performing very well. I think the quality of their performance, uh, the endurance, the training, all of those things have factored into start the season off very well. And for Andy Bishop, these cobblestones would not be just on television this time. 
Laurent Fignon's best finish was third in 1988. Perhaps today he'll get first. And there's defending champion Plankert, who looks happy, and Edwig van Hooyerdonk from Belgium. They're both among the favourites today. And there's Marc Madio, the last French winner in 1985. France doesn't win this race too often. Greg Lamond, who has fitted a pair of forks with shock absorbers on, it seems the most intelligent of all of the special equipment on show today. World champion Rudy Darnans in his rainbow jersey has a list of great Roubaix performances to his credit. And of course, Steve Bauer, the best Canadian professional ever, waits at the start knowing what is expected of him by his team. There is no classic race quite like it, and even the most ardent follower of the sport cannot help but feel the tension. We've come this far, now let's get on with it, seems the unspoken word. The race leaves Compiègne, and with strong winds and slight rain, it will make a fast start. The 56 kilometers of cobbled roads and tracks don't start until Troisville. That comes after 100 kilometers. Then comes the forest of Arenberg. It's the first free for all, and from then on, it's a matter of survival. There's a massive crowd waiting in the forest, a nature reserve that normally allows no wheeled transport other than bicycles. Who wants to take the car over this road anyway? Eleven riders have taken a lead. None are from Motorola. But the chase had been long and hard, and at this point, the escapers had been cut back from five minutes to just a minute. At the front is Gert Jacobs from Holland, leading the charge. Riders try to seek the smoothest section of road, and it seems to be where the crowd is standing. At the back, the field closes in. The crowd was as big this day as any modern-day Paris-Roubaix. If anything, it's getting more popular than ever. stands back from the advancing leading group. The race behind was catching up, but two riders were already in trouble, Greg Lamond and Laurent Fignon. Both have punctured and are now trying to catch up. They're in the third group on the road. So this is the exit now to the forest of Arenberg. The news has reached us that Le Mans and Fignon are chasing, but we're heading on now to Pave number seven. And Steve Bauer has made the split. So the hard work of the Motorola team that has been done today has brought Steve Bauer into this league group. And surely now this is the decisive move. This small group of riders who are building over the chase group. Before Bauer got up here too, Sean Yates was in a small breakaway with Charlie Motte. So he was playing the advance guard for Motorola today. And he's had bad luck again, as he always seems to have in Paris-Roubaix. Yates is not in this group at all now, but one or two top names most certainly are. Number 68, we've just seen there, Nico Verhoeven. There's Steve Bauer, the lone survivor of Motorola today. And I don't think the team will be too surprised about that. They built the whole strategy around him today, and it looks to be paying off at the moment. They've got him exactly where they want him in the front group. There's been that atmosphere all week with the Motorola team that Steve Bauer has been planning to do a good ride today. No previous indication of form. He hasn't had a great start to the season, but psychologically, he's been building for this breakaway. Well, this looks like Laurent Fignon. Fignon with Rudy Darlins here. This is the chase group. Fignon has done nothing but chase all day today. Every time he's contacted the group, bad luck has put him at the back again. There he is, twice winner of the Tour de France and having to work now to contact the group ahead. Bauer is in that group. The world champion Rudy Darlins, also a man of Paris-Roubaix, who's done so well over the years in this event. He too having a season dogged by bad luck, and how many times has that happened to the current world champion? Winning the title is one thing, but once you pull on the rainbow jersey, there he is at the back, you always seem to be on the defensive. In this group with him too, Tom Cordes, former amateur and junior world champion. I think it's Michel Vermotte, the other rider in that group. 
Let's go back up to the lead group. 18 seconds now, that small group, Lono Fignon, should get back. He's closing it down all of the time. And the crowd's lining the route, showing the direction of the race. Well, it's a large group, and the pressure has gone off a little bit at the front. There's every chance now. There's Dornan's on, the Fignon is on, so they've caught up. The pressure's gone off a little bit. Jean-Marie Vompers, number eight, the winner a couple of years ago of Paris Bay, fifth last year, and in the decisive move again. Well, Dornan's there, sort of indicating to Fignon, we've made it back. And a little bit of relief, I would think, if we could see the face of Rudy. And now the pressure is off at the front. This is the first big selection in Paris Bay this year. They have chased down the Forest of Orenburg, and the strong men have regrouped at the front. Bauer in the centre of the group. Fignon is here too. So too Adri van der Poel. Jean-Marie Wompers, plenty of the Panasonic boys are here. Bauer just lying back from the front of the group now, planning the next tentative with the cobblestones that remain. A little bit more action required from the boys at the front. That's Peter de Klerk. Well, the crowd has seen a great classic Paris-Roubaix this year, and this now is Hendrik Redant, who's trying to go for home for Belgium, just in the manner of the old days when Eddie Merckx used to win this race. And now Hendrik Redant, certainly not quite as fashionable in his time as Eddie Merckx was a few years back, but Redant trying to leave this chase group. He's got a teammate in the group too, Peter de Klerk. And I think Mark Mario's made the group, but this is the lead group now beginning to fragment. And there's no sign at the moment of Steve Bauer. That is Bauer. Bauer has realised the attack has gone. He's trying to get across the gap. He did exactly this one year ago, and Redant has punctured. Redant has punctured his lead about 35 seconds, and his back wheel is out. And clearly, the team car is not on hand, because I think the team car, in fact, was trapped behind the small chase group, which was forming behind him. And here they are, and this is Peter de Klerk sitting at the back. The teammate who thought he was defending the lead of Redant, and now he's going to come round and find him standing on the roadside. As they swerve to avoid him, well, the change is a good one, especially for Paddy Roubaix, where the mechanics are so often delayed by the narrow roads, the cars. And there's Redant starting off, and as you can see, he's going to rejoin the race right at the front, but psychologically now, he's going to have to get himself back into gear. From a man who was racing to win Paris Roubaix with a lead of around about 35 seconds, he's now having to think of rejoining the front group, and really that is quite a blow. Well, this is Bauer here, Michel Vermont in the centre, and it looks as though they're trying to get across the gap. They have a bit of work to make up. Let's have a look along the route. One lone rider down there, looks like Marc Sergeant of Panasonic, I think. And a bit further up. Harry Roubaix is blown apart here on the cobbles around Templeuve. And there is the big group, but even further ahead now we've got this small group, which again is splitting up the group that swept by Redant, and that is Mark Maddio going, and he's going at precisely the point where he went when he won this race six years ago. And into the stadium now, and it looks as though nobody is going to touch Mark Maddio. This is the view the spectators have in the velodrome at Roubaix. And all they've got to do now is await the arrival of the man in the flesh. They're beginning to refer, I think, to uh, Mark Maddio as the six-year man because he won the amateur Paris-Roubaix, then he won the big Paris-Roubaix, and now he's going to win it again. They're all separated by six years, and here he comes. Listen to the crowd. A Frenchman at last sweeping in to Paris Bay. There's only been Marc Madio and Bernard Eno since 1956. When Lewis and Bobet was the winner then. When Eno won, Bobet was here on the podium to shake hands with Bernard Eno. Sadly, since then, Lewis and Bobet has passed away. But Bernard Eno will be at the finishing line this time to see Marc Madio. I'm not surprised he punched the air there at the crowd. One full circuit to go of the stadium, and nobody can possibly catch him now. Well, Paul Sherwin has indicated to me that Steve Bauer is catching up with the chase group. Well, it must be some dramatic chase that is he's coming into the stadium. 
because he is just off the back of the lead group at the moment. We can't see them. We've no cameras outside the stadium. All of the cameras concentrating here. We'll have to wait now for the arrival of that chase group and see if Bauer has latched on. But for Marc Mario, it is sweetness today. The winner of Paris-Roubaix for the second time in six years. The three times in all, if you include his amateur victory as well. Here's the chase group onto the stadium now. A lap and a half behind. Jean-Claude Colotti, Franco Balladini. Now, has Bauer made it? Bauer has made it. Bauer is lying. Fifth man down. Well, he could only have just got on. Bauer is in fifth place here. This is the working group that has come together in the last kilometre or so. They've caught uh, Ballerini, who was chasing down Mario alone. He never made progress. They swept him up. Peter de Klerk is in here as well. And Jean-Claude Colotti, the sprinter, is finding himself in the exact position he really doesn't want to be at the front. Bauer is coming on the left of our screens at a run like he made a year ago. That was for first place with Eddie Plankett. Plankett has been dropped with a puncture today, not in at the final showdown, but Bauer most certainly is. And they're coming off the banking now, the couple of lapped riders coming through on the inside there. But this is the sprint for home and Jean-Claude Colotti has led all of the way and holds it on the line. Bauer on the right, well I think he'll be in fourth place, Carlo Bowman's pipping him for third. And watching the sprint too was Marc Madio, his second victory in six years and six years before that he'd won the amateur Paris-Roubaix. Alongside him was Bernard Eno, the only other French winner since 1956. But Steve Bauer had nothing to be ashamed of. He'd ridden well. His fourth place, a kilometre from the finish, seemed impossible. Ninth was more likely. Sean Yates, too, had also ridden well. After the forest of Orenburg, Yates had been in the breakaway that had contained Charlie Motte. And he finished 52nd of the 105 who arrived at Roubaix. This had been a competitive Paris-Roubaix, which, as usual, left its mark indelibly printed on the minds of those who rode it. Bauer kept the Motorola team up front, and the rest of the team did their job too. Andy Bishop finished 48th. A great start to this classic courtship. I think the showers are the nicest part of this race to the riders, and, as usual, there's no privacy attached to professional cycling. <laughs> Enjoying the sun outside, there's relief written all over their faces, but only for a few days. Now this race is over, it's Liège Bast on Liège, but this isn't the time to mention it. Dagato Lauritsen had been the only other finisher. Bob Rowe and John had played their part and left the field of battle satisfied. New Zealander Nathan Dalberg was still smiling, but Bow was the man as everyone had hoped. Well done, Steve. Thanks. Well, it worked out almost as exactly as you said you were going to ride it. Yeah, I think uh, I rode well, and uh, tactically, Maggioli made a good attack. He made a good attack at the right time, and everybody kind of sat looking uh, at each other, and, you know, a couple more guys went, and uh, I think uh, he's looking a little more for the, the teams that had more riders to control that, that attack, you know, like Panasonic and uh, PDM had a few guys, but... Uh, you know, I missed a good one. And, Where did you contact uh, they, that chase group? Uh, the velodrome there. On the velodrome? Yeah, so, I mean, I was working with Duclo LaSalle and, uh, and Vanderpool and a few others, you know, and I got away from them with Sargent and, and Bowman's, and we just caught them just coming into the velodrome. So I did a lot of work to catch, and for the sprint, my legs were a little bit dead, but uh, I was happy, you know, to get in there. In the finished sprint, Bauer was still recovering from the chase, but he produced an inspired shot at the line as he tried to come through on our right. It was close, but Jean-Claude Calotti is a great sprinter. So too Carlo Bowmans, who pushed Bauer back to fourth. Next morning, it's back to the office for the backup team. The Paris-Roubaix is now history, and sights are fine-tuned on liege Baston liege the next target. Running a top professional team requires expertise in administration, bicycle equipment, and the medical knowledge, and the ability to stay one step ahead, too. It's no good on the day finding someone forgot to order the wet weather wear. A professional team can now cost up to $6 million a year to run, but a successful team brings in more than that in public awareness of the product it endorses. Racing equipment is expensive. A wheel can cost $2,000.
and the bicycle is worth up to $5,000. Tires, when flatted, are thrown away or used for training if repaired. John Hendershot, affectionately known by the team as Shot, has to keep his medical shelves fully stocked at Holstra. Uh, over here we have the vitamins that each rider takes. Our sponsor, NutriQuest, right now is computerizing their nutritional programs. From the computerized uh, printout, we can determine what each rider uh, needs. That, those are all based on blood test data, urinalysis data, and a diet log. Over here we have a, a variety of homeopathic remedies that we use also. Uh, each item is researched and there are no ingredients on, presently on any banned list. Here are musettes that each rider receives during the race itself. Sometimes they'll receive uh, one of these uh, in a race, sometimes two. And in those musettes, we include a variety of different foods uh, from glucose replacement fluids like Extran, essentially that's what we've gone to this year, to uh, energy bars, uh, uh, a bar like, uh, for example, a power bar, uh, those are very compatible with these liquid glucose drinks. Uh, NutriQuest, our nutrition sponsor, supplies us with a drink mix, and those drink mixes are also very compatible with the liquid glucose drinks that most teams are going to. And there's the rest of the team equipment. Shoes with their special bindings, plenty of racing jerseys with long sleeves for the cold and short for the summer, and sunglasses too with lenses that can be changed. For example, they'll use clear on a day when there's just a likelihood of grit in the eye. Hard shell helmets compulsory in America, but not so in Europe. Motorola branding is everywhere, and when the riders throw items away, the kids will pick them up. You're looking really great, Jim. The first five miles I've got them in for a bad day here. Did you drop them also? Did they drop you? After a pleasurable ride with Jim Okovic and Eric Hyden, Dagotto Lauritsen had arrived at base with his family. A chance for me to discuss his greatest disappointment. That's the worst race in my life. Do you really feel it cost you the world title? I think so. Yeah. I have to believe that too, but I think I had a good chance to beat both of those guys. Yeah. What and uh, I think maybe uh, Dance would, uh, wouldn't have been there if we didn't crash because we, was like thir we lost 30 seconds. Yeah. Or if he would have been there, we would have been three guys, and I still think I had a decent chance to win, but I for sure would have a chance to have a medal. So it's... At the moment it was bad, but I think later when I really knew what I lost, then it was worse. I was yeah. riding halfway up the hill, because yeah. I attacked from the other guys, and he was the only one to come with, and I just let him through, and he rode for 50 meters, 100 meters, and I looked back on the switchbacks down yeah. there, and Danis was coming up to Gaillon, uh, Gaillard were dressed for, from us, so Dance couldn't ride then. But he thought that Dance was riding to chase him, so he was mad at him. So he was screaming, and then he had one bar, one hand off, and he turned around. And he was very steep, so there was nothing to do. I was first on the bike again, before him. But then my chain was uh, stuck in between, so I couldn't get it, I couldn't start. So I had to go off again, and then uh, by that time, uh, everybody was gone. That was really a bad luck. Yeah. First I broke my hand in the beginning of the classics and I was eight weeks away from uh, racing. Then I was coming back in, in form and then I think that was one of my best races. So. Before Liège Baston Liège on Sunday, there is one more Belgian classic, the Flesh Wallon. George is first to head off towards Spa in the Belgian Ardennes. This race is important to the team as a stepping stone to Liège Baston Liège, as it covers some of the same roads. But I've taken the chance to call on Eddie Merckx at his bicycle factory near Brussels Airport. This legendary cyclist still has no equal in the racing world today. Ah, ben, ils sont, ils sont pratiquement faits. Je les envoie euh, demain ou plus tard. Ouais, ouais. D'accord, oui, bébé. Eddie, the Motorola is a new sponsor in the sport. It's a multi-million dollar sponsor now. And uh, you're helping the sponsorship with the provision of Eddie Merck bicycles. How many teams do you actually sponsor in the sport? We are sponsoring uh, four professional teams, but I think uh, the Motorola is the most uh, prestigious team. 
Why is that? It's because it's American? It's different to yeah, all of the others? I think others. it's uh, first because it's American and uh, I think also because Motorola is a very big name in the business. Yes. And uh, for me, it's, a, it's very exciting to, to sponsor with the Motorola team. Does this team have the depth to help people like Anderson, Bauer, Hampson win the Tour de France, perhaps? Oh, yes, for sure. I think uh, riders like uh, Sean Yates, uh, Ron Kiefeld, uh, Dahlberg, they are very good riders and there's a very complete team and I think they can defend in all the parts of the state race. Well, this week coming up, we've got Liège, Baston Liège, Eddie. You won that race five times, which is uh, an unbelievable record. Uh, do you think that somebody on the team might do a good performance uh, on Sunday? Oh, I think uh, normally Andy Amston or uh, Phil Anderson, when they are in a very good condition, uh, they can, they can win uh, liege baston -Liege. Now, in the case of Hampson, he is still feeling a little bit low morale because he is sick after a race in Spain. And Andy, by his own admission, can't handle being sick easily. You know, it affects his men him mentally. What would you advise now for Andy? How, do, how can he pull himself back into the right mental approach? Yeah, I think uh, what, Andy, what Andy needs more, it's uh, more racing, because I, th I think uh, the problem for Andy is too much training and not race enough. And naturally now with uh, the Tour de Pays Basque, uh, when you are sick, you cannot ride on the, on the best level, but uh, yeah, I think it will be fast finish because uh, they have very good support also in the team uh, to recover him. And then also now with uh, the Fresh Wallon and Liege Baston Liege after them, it must be back uh, the good Amsterdam. Merckx himself still rides his bicycle and shortly after our interview he was off to the south of France with some friends to ride 120 kilometres a day and drink some fine French wine in the evening. His 525 victories between 1965 and his retirement in 1978 included all of the world's major races except Paris Tour. Most of his victories came alone in champion style. He lived up to his nickname, the Cannibal, and ate them all alive. It sounds a silly question, but why was it you who was chosen to be such a, a fantastic athlete? Yeah, I think uh, that's, that's natural. I think uh, my parents make me like that and uh, they give me maybe some more uh, uh, physical uh, ability. ability, yes. But after that, I think also because uh, I was training always very hard and also when I was winning a race, I was not thinking it was uh, finished. It's, then I think it's hard to, to come to the top, but it's, it's harder to stay on the top. Now, Eddie, going back to the, to the great days when you were winning the Tour de France five times, um, seven Milan San Remos, three Paris Roubaix, the, the, the list is endless. I think you rode about 1,800 races as a professional. You won almost one third of those races. Mm -hmm. uh, it must be very demoralizing for the rest of the riders who lived in your time. Yeah, but it's normal, it's sport. When, when you go to the start of a race and you do sport, you, you st if you start for not winning, yeah, you have a bad mentality. So in the big races, it's very important to win because there are big races. But in small races, the people maybe is, uh, give you money and then you have to give for your money. And that's very important thing. I think you must be a professional on all the line and not uh, only a few times per year. Now, when you were a cyclist, you were very meticulous with your equipment. You were always measuring the height of your saddle to absolute perfection. You would change the height slightly if there was a special course coming along. Um, have you applied that same attitude to the business? Oh, yeah, sure. When, the, when some people come here to, to measure, and also with the, the motor rattle team, I remember the first time I was going there, and then when I see a rider who is not staying so well on the bike, I try to change them and, uh, and try to convince them uh, to, have another, to have another position because I think it's, it's very important also to have a, a good position on, on the bike. The progress in the sport since you were a cyclist has advanced so quickly um, in the aerodynamics, the lightness of the machines. I mean, what would you have done, Eddie, if you'd have had a bike like this when you were a cyclist? Oh, I One more races? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> no, one more race now because in the time I was riding, the, the riders have the same bikes than I have. And so now also the riders have the, everything, have mm. the same uh, bike, so it's making not much different, I think. So. But the one thing, of course, the hour record, Eddie, which was yours, and then Moser came along with a crazy bicycle and takes away your record. Do yeah, you feel but, bad about that? 
No, it's a, no, a new technology. It's not more the same. No, you can compare the two records. The one is with the traditional bike, and the other one is with uh, the new technology. And mm -hmm. so that's that's different. Let's go back then, Eddie, to when you were a cyclist. I can remember you racing, and I, I once remember a cyclist saying to me at the Amstel Gold Race that uh, when I said to him, who, who will win today? And the rider said to me, if Eddie Merckx has decided he wants to win this race, then Eddie will win this race. That is the power you had over the finest cyclists of that time. Um, I mean, did you feel the pressure was on you every time you went to a race, that you must perform so good for the people? Oh, yes, but uh, people... Uh... It's, not, it's uh, never enough for the people now, but uh, the pressure was always. Uh, it's why it's so difficult to stay uh, for many years on the top, and uh, that's why also I stopped on, uh, on 30, 33 years, because the pressure was so high, and it's not physical that you cannot do more, but uh, the pressure is too high, and then one time uh, it's better that you stop. This, of course, is something which is the Motorola team is now facing. It's a new multi-million dollar sponsor they have to prove to that sponsor in one year that they are good and therefore results in the pressure and it's difficult for a team now isn't it? No, I think they have also good riders, uh, they have very good experience and also they have good manager in the team. Uh, I think it's a very good uh, complete team and they have all very good results in the beginning of the season like Phil Anderson was winning the Tour de and uh, also in Sicily week and uh, they have good results and I think uh, they will have also very good results uh, like in the Tour of Switzerland, uh, Tour de France and I hope that uh, Motorola will be very happy because I think uh, the American uh, professional team in Europe is very considerate and uh, it's something other than uh, European team. Eddie Merckx remains an expert in his field. His bicycles bear his personal touches and he is always looking for the innovation. As a father too, he's pleased that his son Axel is also a champion of the military, and Eddie, as a member of the Olympic Selection Committee, may one day be faced with a difficult decision. But he's pleased with one decision, that of supplying his machinery to Motorola. He also promised to call in on Andy Hampston on the day before Liège passed on Liège. But next it was flesh wool on, and there was fresh blood on the team with the arrival from Spain of Californian Norm Alvis, although he should be used now to the northern climbs. Brian Walton, a talented climber from Canada and a very good time trial rider, was here as well. But I guess since he's the big guy and wins all the races, this is, this is his look, you know. The team had taken over a local cafe to get changed in. And Phil Anderson, his wounds healing, was also back on the team for this first of two hilly races. In the street, Tour de France winner Pedro Delgado was almost ready. This race was an important part of his pre-Tour de France preparation. And his lieutenant, Miguel Indurain, who has been ill but wanted a top performance. Claudio Chiapucci, second to Le Monde in the Tour de France. They were all here. Raul Alcala, the Mexican winner of last year's Tour de Trump and also last year's Tour of Mexico for a second time. He's shortly to ride his first Tour of Spain. Greg had plenty of support, but had said already that he felt his form was not good enough to get a result in the Ardennes. Irishman Stephen Roach, a winner again this season and hoping to rival Le Monde in July's Tour de France. Time for a joke. With snow, rain and sleet forecast, the field makes ready. This race is famous for its ascent of the Mer de Huy a brute of a hill in the finishing town to be climbed this year four times. Not surprisingly, the field stays together for a while. Just one lone leader in Danny Neskins, who went clear soon after the start, his moustache dripping with the chill moist air of a cold day. But on the first climb of the wall, there were signs of fatigue, 
and soon the field would break up completely. Both Phil Anderson and Brian Walton are well to the fore, but Andy Hampston was already in trouble. There were two clear favourites, the Italian and defending champion Moreno Argentin and Belgian champion Claude Coquillion, who had prepared especially for this race and the Liège Baston Liège Classic. He was born in the region and retires this season, and he's made no secret of his desire to win both races. But in the end, the victory went to Moreno Argentin. He broke away 70 kilometres from the finish, fell off, remounted, and then won alone. There was some consolation, though, for Claude Coquillion, because he finished in the second group and in second place. It had not been a great day for the team, and only Anderson could finish, but he did make the top 20. Steve Bauer had missed Flesh Wallon and joined the team the next day at the Liège base. Professionals like Dag Otto were hoping for a change of form. What did it take to actually bring yourself onto form? I mean, you know yourself so well, you know how to do it, but I mean, how do you know when it's all going to happen? Normally I should have been in form a long time ago because normally I'm always good in the classics, but this year I've been suffering from illness since September, October, so that has kept me back and I've been suffering much more than I should do, so that was hard for my morale and everything, but now it seems like I've got the right medicine and everything, so I'm on the right track now, but I'm still a bit behind usual form. So for Liège, based on Liège, Jack, what do you expect from yourself? For myself, I expect to do as good as I can for Phil, and uh, I hope I can be better in uh, Amsterdam. Yeah. But I don't expect to be in the top 10 or top 15 in Liège. I think Phil, Phil has a very good chance there. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. And what about Andy Hamston, twice winner of the Tour of Switzerland and third in the Tour of Italy? The American has been ill in Spain. His morale is low. Andy, you're coming in for Liège Baston Liège. You were spared the agony of Paris Bay. How are you feeling after your sickness in Spain? Uh, I haven't quite bounced back in, uh, on Wednesday in the flesh alone. <clears throat> really, the body wasn't there. So, uh, you know, just the important thing now is, since the flu is a bit of a mystery to me, to just keep training and let my body recover. But if it does come around, you know, make the most of it. If it comes around by Sunday for Liège Baston Liège, all the better. But it's your type of course, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, I've never quite done as well in the race as I would have liked to. April seems to be a tough month for me. Um, but it's, it's very good. You know, I've known the, got to know the hills pretty well now. And, uh, you know, it's a great race for me to try to prove something. Are you a guy for the warmer weather? I mean, you always come good in midsummer, like. Yeah, uh, it really a lot of seems riders like don't it's like not until May that, uh, that my form really comes around, even though the races are good for me, even though I, you know, motivate myself and try to get up for them. It never, it's never really happened. Yeah. Um, It'd be nice if it did, because they are real good races for me. Now, flesh were on yesterday. The weather was really grim. Wasn't it? It, was it wasn't very pleasant. <laughs> it's definitely a spring day. It's when you don't want to be a professional bike rider. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not the kind of day one plans his career. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you give up yesterday? Yeah, I just fell off the pace, and uh, there's nothing I could do with probably 70 kilometers to go, which is a pretty bad indication. I mean, some of the young lads watching this will think Andy Hampson never gets tired. You know, you can't fall off the pace because you've been fourth in the Tour de France, but you, you still yeah, just like the rest of them. Uh, it's up and down, you know, and, you know, the better I do, I just raise my standards, so then when I'm, I'm not doing as well, it, it's twice as hard. Yeah. And today you're going out with the boys? Yeah, wow. it looks like we're going to do the last, all the last hills in the <clears throat> Liège Bastogne, and yeah. it should be 150 Ks or so, and it'll be good to put them all together and just to, really to get my my mind in the right frame it's a bit longer but it's a lot like warming up for a time trial to really go over the whole course and then when it comes time to do it in the race then we already know it first though it's off from liege by car and along the auto route to bastogne and then the team will ride back over the route taking special note of the two new hills on the course one of the hardest is la redoute and after four hours the riders were back in view Ron Kiefel on the left had flown in from America. No time to rest, as he's needed for Sunday. The former US champ is a valued member of the team, while alongside him is Andy Hampston, a superb climber, if only he can attune himself in time for the big day. And behind is Mike Carter, a real talent, but still feeling his way around at this level of racing.
The Liège race is all hills. This is only one of ten, and they are all steep. The Motorola team wasn't the only one checking the route out either. Charlie Motte had passed by earlier with his French RMO team. And Argentin, the winner of Flesh Wallon and favoured to win again, had led his Ariostia squad by. Phil Anderson has finished second once and twice third in this race. He is still Motorola's best hope, with Steve Bauer a good outside shot. Again, they will be the team's leaders and the rest must help when possible. The weather had changed too, it's cold now and has been all week and the Ardennes can be very cruel in bad weather. When Bernard Eno won here in 1980, he finished like a snowman and was one of only a handful to complete the course. So, after the stars had gone by, there was me. All I seemed to be doing this week was following the team around. I was beginning to think that making this video was not such a good idea. You know, keeping up with these guys in the Motorola team is kind of hard, and so it should be, because after all, they're the best bike riders in the world. Today they've ridden 180 kilometers. We're just two days away from Liège, Bastogne Liège. This is Laradout, one of the most famous climbs on this classic, and it comes just before the finish. One more big climb to come called the Côte des Forges. And you know, this hill and the next hill is where the climbers put home the killer instinct. This is where they springboard to victory. Now this year, Phil Anderson has joined the Motorola team and also Steve Bauer. He didn't ride in Flesh Wallon yesterday. He's back too. He had a great ride in Peru Bay. Now we look for a good ride in the Ardennes. There's also Andy Hampson. There's a big question mark on Andy. Is he well now after sickness in Spain? We're going to find out. The boys have gone. I'm now going to have to catch up with them and then we'll see what they've got to say about the Battle of the Ardennes still to come. Oh, there was in fact two hills to come and the other was the Côte d'Ornay, but the team kindly waited for me. Ron Kiefel on the left seemed intent to ride out his jet lag and Andy was with him. For the rest of the ride they stayed at the front and I followed looking forward to dinner. As the riders trickled in from the ride, they were looking for the mechanics, who else, of course they would, to hand their bikes to them. And Eddie Merckx, as promised, travelled to the Ardennes to speak with Andy Hampston. Merckx would not see the race on Sunday, as his son was racing in the Belgian Championship, so he made a special trip to see the team. Yeah, better race a little more and training less now. Well... Last time you trained a lot now. Now? Well, oh, yeah, because... before the pay basket and uh, that's race, no? I was racing weekends. Oh, yeah. I did a Criterium International. Oh, that's good. But, but I fell apart there. But uh, I'll have 10 days train, do five days hard mm -hmm. in the mountains, but shorter intervals. Yeah, it must be attention to not train too long also. Eh? Yeah. That's the power for the race. Eh? Always. <laughs> yeah. But then it's good because there's... There's all of Romandy, one day off, four days of Trentino. Mm -hmm. and then we'll have two weeks, we'll have a training camp in the mountains in the Alps. Just five days and then... But it uh, was good, Paris Nice also, the last... Uh, Paris Nice was, was, was really good, yeah. But then I, I got this influenza and in, uh, in Spain. Uh, if, you, if you're sick, it's better no, no riding, eh? Yeah. yeah. No waiting and... But then I started feeling better. Started training, and then at Flesh Alone, uh -huh. empty. But now you look good. Now I look good, but tomorrow you have to <laughs> tomorrow big race. I'll see. Everybody had now moved into the hotel for the weekend. The heavy work left to Shot and Trudy. In the hotel, the team was completed with the arrival of Dr. Massimo Testa. It was left to Trudy, though, to sort out the nightmare of reservations. I had an appointment with Phil Anderson, who would given the new team the sort of opening they could only have dreamt of. I think anybody, when they go to a new team, uh, they're motivated because they want to, you know, show the the team that you know it wasn't a mistake, and so sort of like you know, and them choosing this rider, and uh, you know, it's good for the for the sponsors, Motorola. So, um, plus personally, you know, it's it's uh, I always want to do better every year. You know, I'm 33 now, so I'm not. Uh, I'm not as young as a lot of other riders on the team, uh, or even in the sport, you know, I'm one of the older riders now. And, uh, you know, I think 
you know, I want to prove to, to myself and uh, people around me that I'm not finished and I want to, uh, that I'm still up and alive and kicking. You know that tomorrow you are literally going to go through hell in the effort to succeed again because all the riders suffer. People think the top professionals uh, find it easier for some reason than the other riders, but it's not easy for you, is it? No, certainly not. You know, I think, um, you know, sometimes I go to a race and I'll be riding a race and I know exactly what the hell's going to go on. I know where the brake's going to go. And I'll be sitting there, I can see it go, and, and sometimes you can do nothing about it, you know, because you're just physically not in condition or you're not uh, good that day that to happen. And other times, you're the person that everybody else is looking at, you know. It's just like which side of the uh, field you're on. Outside, just another hotel car park, but the same mechanics were still hard at work. This race was different to Paris-Roubaix in every conceivable way. The bikes, too, are slightly different. Uh, it's a lighter weight frame. Uh, we have uh, lighter weight wheels on the bike. With uh, Instead of 32 spokes, it has 28. It's also, the wheel is laced differently. This is what we call a radial wheel, where the spoke comes from the hub and goes directly to the rim instead of crossing over other spokes before it goes to the rim. Uh, it also has a lower profile tire because the road is smooth and uh, they don't need that extra protection with, that they get from the higher profile tire. In Paris-Roubaix they use a 7 speed freewheel in the back, now we're using an 8 speed freewheel. Also the gearing in the rear for Paris-Roubaix is only a 12 uh, 20 and uh, for Liège Bastogne Liège we use a 12 23. Uh, in the front, last week they were using a 30, a uh, 45 chain ring. T tomorrow they will be using a 39 because uh, there's quite a lot of hills in the race. The bike, the other dimensions on the bike are exactly the same as Steve's heavy bike. So when he gets on it, it feels you know, the, just like his other bike, except a little bit lighter. Now, Jim has just told us that uh, your job in the age, based on the age, is not to finish, but he's given you some special work to do at the start, so I guess that's the job as a professional. Yeah, you know, you can't, you have to be very realistic about what you, what you can accomplish. And, uh, you know, I have the goal, my goal tomorrow will be to help the team try to do my work early, cover the brakes. If somebody gets a flat, go back, help them with a the flat tire. Uh, if there's a crash, you know, come back and pick up the riders that, have fallen, uh, you know, just kind of do all the dirty work the first half of the race because since I have done so much traveling, flown to America, come back, uh, I know I'm not ready for 250 kilometers. What's your job tomorrow? Have you been given your orders yet? I have. Uh, my job is to watch after Phil and Steve and uh, keep them uh, in position and keep them out of the wind. What are you, how are you finding the racing here now as you've come over and sort of living the, the top pro lifestyle now? It's a bit different than the States. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more difficult, I'll tell you. It's, it's actually brutal. Oh, yes, but being a top professional does have its rewards. The right. food's good. About tomorrow morning for breakfast. I have to go to the kitchen to set the breakfast. How many rice and how many pasta? Oh, pasta. 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 Half and half. Max Tester is now in the kitchen with the chef de cuisine discussing menus for the riders. Diet is important, plenty of carbohydrate is required and pasta is favoured. The only question, how do you eat it at 7 o'clock in the morning? When you're in the middle of eating one meal, you've got to decide what you want for the next. The Motorola team were staying in the same hotel as Pedro Delgado's squad and Stephen Roach's Belgian team, but they all ate in separate areas. On race day, the mechanics, who else, were first outside, and George was as enthusiastic as ever. Neil checked the wheels and George oiled the chains. While inside, Jim Okovitz was giving his team briefing one hour to go. At the start of the race today, Carrera and Aereo stay control a lot of the race, the first part of the race, and they're not going to let brakes go away and get, get, get a lot of time. 
I think that they're, they're in a good position to do well in the race today, and the teams are going to control a lot of that stuff. Steve, you and Phil, you've got to be real attentive. You know, you guys know when something's going to go. I mean, if you see Crickley on going in Argentine, those guys are all, go all going to react at the same time, and that's the bike race. The race start is only 400 meters away, and the weather is not looking good. Schott is checking supplies for later on, while Bauer seems unusually bubbly before a big race. There's no doubt who the press expect to do well, though. What about Jim? We'd like to see a top 10 finish today, and, and maybe a little bit better if, if, uh, if we get the chance towards the end of the race to make it happen. Most riders had stayed in the area after Flesh Wallon, and the crowds were big, hoping yet for victory by Claude Coquillon. He's never won this race, and this was his final chance. Among the early arrivals was Pedro Delgado. And Edwig van Hooyedonk, winner of the Tour of Flanders. A hopeful Coquillon. And Miguel Ingerain. Greg Lamont's form, too, was better than this time last year. Milan Sanremo winner Claudio Chiapucci was now a real champion in Italy's eyes. And Stephen Roach had told me he would be in the decision in this race, although he may not win it. So, confident all, at least that's the impression they give, the field heads out into the Ardennes. It's a beautiful countryside that has been ripped apart by world wars and American tanks still stand in Bastogne as a symbol of freedom. For a while, the race keeps together, but soon... There's still one rider away on his own, Thierry Bourguignon, from the Toshiba team, but he's got about five minutes lead. But as we start to get into this zone here, we've got lots more climbs. And I think he's been away for so long, he's going to start to get tired. And the race is speed up behind and we're going to, I think we're going to catch him. We've got most of our boys still at the front of the race, so, you know, there's a long way to go. Tiddy Bourguignon had attacked with 200 kilometers to go, and most of the hills still to come. His lead accelerated to seven minutes, but the bunch had seen such a move many times before, and Bourguignon was not a noted winner. The Motorola team were under pressure, but who wasn't as the pace was stepped up in what turned out to be a very aggressive race. Andy Hamston was still without morale, and retirement seemed the only answer. He could only hope for better days to come. Paul Sherwin knows how he feels after spending 10 years living in France as a top professional and during that time he rode seven tours to France. The thing about cycle racing is that you are only as good as your last performance. It really is a cruel world. Do you want to drive towels or around you? Car radio continues to sing out the problems with the race and he wasn't worried anymore. In the hills, but when it was over, it was over. It looks right in the first one. Mm. Oh, Steve, is Steve still in there? He's in there, but not doing well. Phil looks. Phil went past in third place. Cashier in third. Andy is very concerned now about his physical condition, but time is still on his side. There remains six months of the cycling season, and by then, he could be the best again. The race leaders are heading now towards La Redoute, and the group in front is now 10 strong. Argentine is there, so too Coquillon, but Anderson, the only team hope left with the chance, is chasing in a group a minute behind. This is Coquillon's final chance to win, and he attacks after Rolf Sorensen, who has already taken a 30 seconds lead. Sherwin is already at the finish. Paul is about to finish. You're the publicity director. What are you going to say about the team today? Well, not had the most successful day in the world today, but uh, Phil's in the second group, and it looks as if they might just catch the group in front. So 
We'll have to see how, uh, how they perform, but it's not been a, a brilliant day for us from a publicity point of view. Well, you've ridden this race, Paul. You've ridden seven tours to France. You know the ups and downs of professional cycling, don't you? I do. You know, you have good days, you have bad days. We've had some very good days up to now. We've had a couple of hard days so far, but, I mean, the season's a very long one. and We've already had quite a big bite of the cake. And in the sprint for the finish, Kukilion had been joined. He'd been joined by Ingerain, Sorensen and Argentin. Yet the Belgian tried to say farewell in the best way possible. But again he was beaten by Moreno Argentin for the second time in four days. No Steve Bauer latching on this time at the finish and Phil Anderson who finished 15th, Dag Otto Lauritsen and Frankie Andreo, they were the only finishers of the team. It had been disappointing for the team, no one likes defeat but knocks have to be taken along with the success. Well, it hasn't been a day for the Motorola team, but you win some and you lose some. Last week in Paris Bay, we saw Steve Bauer fight and finish fourth. Today, Phil Anderson was in the third group to finish and Steve Bauer and Andy Hampson, in fact, didn't reach the finishing line. You know, the Motorola team, though, are a full professional outfit. They're now facing the end of the Classics, then the Tour de France, the Tour de Switzerland before that. The World Championships and the World Cup will continue. It's a long, long year, and we'll be reading about successes in the Motorola team in the months to come, I'm sure. We'd just like to thank the team for allowing us into their private lives for 12 days. We've seen the ups and downs of a great team, a team that, as I say, will have success. We hope you've enjoyed this insight into the life of a pro team over these last 12 days. A little bit of analysis of what, what happened today, because you saw all of the race more than we did. Well, I didn't see that much of the race, <laughs> but I did see some of it. I think the, uh, the, uh, the race was pretty much like we said it was going to be. It was kind of controlled at the start. The, the speed was high all day, yeah. but it was pretty much controlled by, by the big teams. And um, the, uh, the race really started uh, in La Roche and there was a few attacks up the climb and then that was Kirk Leone's first time when he went and yeah. um, well Phil Anderson was reading it well at one point well yeah, I think he read it well all day you know this is a it's a difficult race to to read hundred percent I think he was very close to reading it hundred uh, percent but you also have to have the legs to make it yeah and I think that uh, he was with the group that was just right there but not didn't quite make it you know they stayed in a minute for the last 80 kilometers. So they were they were definitely in the race, it's just that uh, they didn't have just that little bit of extra to, to make up that difference. So you're not gonna go back to the team tonight and shout at them too much? No, I don't think so, no, <laughs> no. You're quite pleased then with the swing classic so far? I think that uh, we we need to make some improvements. I'm not gonna say it's it's 100%. We're 100% we're, we're satisfied with what we're seeing right now. I think Phil is doing an excellent job and uh, he was about, I'd say, 15 today. Yeah. So I think he did a, he did an excellent job. Um, we've got to get the other guys a little bit more consistent. Um, what happened to Steve Bauer today? I haven't talked to him yet. No, so but he I didn't finish, did he? He didn't finish, no. 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 Okay. So now, where do you go from here, Jim? From here, we're going to be getting ready for Amstel Gold. We'll be uh, doing training up there on Tuesday on the course, because it's a new finish this year. Right. And, uh, um, We'll spend Tuesday there, Wednesday we race, and then Friday we'll be back in for, for Amstel to get ready for that again. So the races go on. They go on and on and on and on. <laughs> I do, uh, I finish, but uh, I wasn't super good. It's, it's getting better, my form is getting better. I think my sickness that I had since the winter is uh, definitely getting better. So I'm not happy with the performance, but I'm happy that I'm progressing. You know, I just didn't have the legs today, you know? You know, it's pretty good. Yeah, maybe if I had some other guys there, you know, might have been able to do a little better. I know how to do a bit of work myself. But... You're the only, only one there from the team. Yeah. Anyway, okay. maybe they're saving themselves. <laughs> Good seeing you. Thanks. Yeah.